I should say, everybody, it's really great to see you here. This is the second of our uh, uh, deep practice colloquiums. Uh, these are ex these are um, intended to give us all a bit of an insight into how people are operationalizing transformation and change and adopting agile in their organizations. And we're so grateful that uh, members of this community are stepping up to do that. And today's presenter is no less than uh, Melanie uh, Pena from uh, the Comcast, who is a member of our colloquium and a person who's done some amazing work in this area. And we had a fabulous conversation yesterday. I think we're in for a treat with what she has to share with us. But again, just an open invitation to all of you. Uh, if you would like to be a presenter at a future colloquium, we're going to try to do three or four of these a year. And uh, uh, we, we take on all comers, all, all activities, all actions, uh, whether it's about learning and growing in yourself, or if you have something profound that you have created that you want to share with this group, we'd be happy to feature you in a, in a future effort of that respect. So please don't be shy. And uh, Wayne, would you like to introduce uh, Mel? Yeah, and, and before I forget, this is an interactive session. Mel is going to do a little bit of talk at the beginning, uh, but, but we're going to expect everybody in the call to contribute. Because what we found is that the interactions uh, create a lot of insights, which can turn, turn into content. And Mel has a perspective from a fairly large organization, but you may have a perspective from a different size organization and different nuances that make sense. And again, we've developed these because in our practice and our teaching, these are issues that came up. The last month we talked about performance management. This month is about leading transformation. Next month is going to be about agile diversity and inclusion. And so these are topics that seem to be challenging to our students and, and our clients and our friends. And so uh, Mel is someone I've known for a long time. Um, she still takes my calls. I don't know why, but uh, you know, she's a good friend. She's been uh, a member of my HR round table and just really always admired her ability to really execute. And when we thought about this topic, I said, who better to describe this than Mel? She's been with Comcast for a long time in multiple roles. Um, I think she's known as an executor, someone who gets things done in an organization. And if you know Comcast, like most organizations, it's a fairly complex, a uh, little bit of political organization that takes a lot to maneuver around. And I think she's done um, a great job and uh, always learn by listening to her. And I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to hear more. So Mel, anything you want to add to that before yeah, you take it away? No, thank you. Um, I have been with Comcast for a long time, uh, 25 years actually. Um, so I've seen the growth in our business, obviously, the growth um, in the industry, and um, I've, I've been in several roles. Um, I've led transform, transformative initiatives, um, and I've also been part of those that have fizzled. Um, so I'd love to open this up and kind of get the juices flowing by asking all of you it, just a series of questions so I can learn from you and, and share kind of the paths that I've been on, the journey I've been on, what I've found to be the most effective way um, to help drive transformation and be able to share a little bit of where we've stubbed our toes, but where we've had success. And hopefully you'll share as well. Um, we'll learn from each other in the next, uh, let's say 50 minutes or so. Um, but let me just start with a question around, um, because this was new to us, maybe only within the last, let's say, six, seven years have we um, actually adopted a formal change management methodology. Curious to know, um, do you have one that you use? So is this a poll, Wayne? They should uh, yes, answer on here? I think people gotcha. are answering it now, yeah. And it doesn't matter what it is, um, although I'll get to that. Okay, a few more. I think we're all okay here. Okay, we'll end it here. Okay. Uh, can oh, everybody see good. that? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Um, like I said, in order, as large as Comcast, um, we had not um, leveraged one, uh, but for maybe six, seven years ago when we implemented something, uh, we implemented the ProSci ADCAR methodology, which I'll allude to, but it's, it's less about what one you use, um, but interested that you have one. Okay. Um, Wayne, is the next question, which one do you have, if you have one? Uh, let's see here now. 
No, that's basically just an open source question. Maybe people gotcha. in the chat room, if you could just indicate if you have a formal change program, what it is. Take a minute to do that. Oh, great, Ed Carr, got it. I guess while you're all kind of weighing in, and this way we can learn from each other what you're using. Um, you know, the reason Comcast leaned into this space was we could very clearly see that as our industry and as our business was evolving, the kinds of change that we were trying to drive involved multiple stakeholder groups were massively complex and required a level of rigor that we didn't have. Um, and we knew that speed to market on any one of those complex initiatives was compromised because we were coming at the change from different perspectives with no sense of order. Uh, and so we leaned into a model that for us, with, and those of you that have the pro-Syadkar approach, know it's a data-rich model. It informs the organization on the basis of data. Um, and for us, we're a very data-driven organization. That spoke to us. If we were going to convince our stakeholders you know, that we were doing well, not doing well, that we needed to pivot, we needed to have data behind it. And, and that model seems to... Um, kind of generate the kind of data that we needed to move the organization forward. Um, but curious of those of you that have a model, um, you know, how many of you um, find that you pick and choose components of the model? I don't know if that's a poll question or if that could be yeah. a chat question. It's a chat question. Okay. Or, or, you know, if you want to talk, it's not a problem. This is open yeah, space. please share. Um, yeah. I will tell you the pro ad car model was very um, intense for an org like ours, which was used to executing, then clean up later and figure it out as you go. Um, the notion of all of the kind of setup around change management, the data um, to inform our change approach, our program management approach um, was intense. And we found ourselves picking and choosing elements of the model we liked and other elements that we didn't like that involved too much stakeholder and et cetera, we pushed aside. Just curious where everybody else has been on the change journey. And feel free to just weigh in with a story if you have one. Looks like Alicia developed their own, I believe. A Alicia, bottom, line, I... bottom line change model, can you explain that, Alicia? Sorry, I'll come off uh, for a second. Um, there's an existing change model called bottom line change that um, is not, I don't know how well known it is, but it's one that my company has been dabbling with for a while, but we wanted to try and create some actual tools related to it to give people some accountability around the process to make sure that people weren't picking and choosing elements of it, but we're following a logical process in identifying stakeholders, identifying timelines and um, going back as as Melanie said the data is important to us too and, and measuring during the process to see that we can show either motion forward or need to go back and make changes to the change we're trying to make. Yeah that's great. Others? Okay. okay well now I'm going to get into a series of project questions I hope you'll all be really honest about. Um, how many of you backed away from a project because you could see that the org wasn't quote unquote ready? Hold on one second. How do I, uh, let's see. I have another poll on here, but it's okay. only showing the same one. Let's see, stop sharing results. Give me a second here. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's either you backed away or you could see that the org was ready and then it just, people started to fade away <laughs> because the org wasn't ready. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Here we go. There we go. Yep. Hmm. And you can already sense the next question I'm going to ask. Um, what signs did you have that the org wasn't ready? I think, Nancy, you say change fatigue. 
but what other signs? You, is that a chat question, Wayne? People can yes, put it in the chat if you don't mind. Yes. Got it. Mm, yeah. These are great. These are great. They're going to go to the heart of my lessons learned. So this is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> this is all spot on. Yeah, that's great. Um, next question. How many of you were brought in to a project to save it or get it back on track? And then my follow on to that poll question is, what did people expect you to do to get it back on track? Wave a magic wand and fix everything? Is that an option? <laughs> magic, magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Calm everybody down. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. No expectations, just fix it. <laughs> <laughs> It's so right. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's great. All right. Next question. Um, have you ever experienced a project that just fizzles or lives on, but in slow motion? It's just the same project that lives for about six years. You, you plug away, you know, what do you, so have you ever been part of something like that? And then my follow on question in chat will be, what's the reason that the org allows it to just kind of live on or lets it die and simmer? Yeah, these are these are awesome. Yeah, keep trying to fix the same thing. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Great. All right, last question, then we'll jump into, uh, you know, kind of a, a discussion of, of the change process um, and, and where most of us find ourselves and where we should really lean in to drive the most effective change at, at complex, massive levels. Um, this will be the uplifting question for the, for the morning. <laughs> Have you had success? in executing a complex transformational initiative. Um, have you experienced that? And then my follow on in chat will be, to what do you attribute the success? We have a, a lie detector attached to the Zoom <laughs> thing. So um, if you're telling a lie, it's gonna show up. Just wanted to be honest up front. Hmm. That's great. Yes, I should. <laughs> wow, we should end it right now. That's right. Okay. Just uh, hold on. Sure. That's kind of surprising. <laughs> nice plug, Steve. Interesting. 
That's great. But then I wasn't sharing the results on. <laughs> oh, good. Everybody's had some element of success, which is awesome. And it's important. I'm glad there's 100% because you need to know what success feels like, right? What it looks like. Um, and, and if you've had a chance to step back from that project and assess what did you do to make it so successful or what did the org do? What decisions did it make? How did you pivot to get it back on track to get to success? Those are all important learnings um, that I'm hoping we can kind of bring into our conversation. Signal to zero, that's great. If you could just enter those in the chat. That's awesome. All right. so. Why don't we just kind of take a step back and, and talk a little bit about um, transformation. Being at Comcast, I've, I've led several transformation efforts. Um, you know, anything from business, um, key business priorities um, around, you know, customer um, consent um, to, you know, some of the work that we do to improve and the reliability um, of our network which all of us are on with broadband um, through COVID um, to just a, a systems conversion in HR, moving from paper to automation um, to actually managing through COVID itself. So a number of efforts, some you know more compliance driven, others clearly voluntary efforts that we wanted to lean into um, and other pieces you know, came out of crisis management and the need to navigate during crisis, which we've all done. But I've, I've found now the, the secret sauce of where I think we're the most successful. So I thought I'd share that, but it's, it's certainly not going to be new to any of you on this call. All of your comments um, and what you've all, all experienced in change associated with transformation tell me you already know where the pain, the resistance lies. Um, and, and what I want to do then is focus a little bit on how setting up for success and in leaning into the really, really hard work of driving transformation. So Wayne, I don't know if yep, you were- I will share the screen. Great. One second here. Uh, yes, okay. And I, please jump in um, and, and chime in and, and give us your anecdotes. I think this model is not gonna be shocking. It's gonna be a little bit like, well, duh. Um, but really the learning is gonna come from the you know, the stories you all have of experiences you've had with initiatives you've been driving and where you found yourself. But this tends to be where we, where we typically engage around um, transformative efforts. And, and all transformation, really the fundamental, um, kind of the underlying uh, platform driving transformation is change management. We know that. Um, and really, when you look at, you know, transformation that is um, both comprehensive and dramatic change coupled by, you know, a lot of stakeholder groups that you're impacting. That's when change management, you really have to lean into your change management practices. And that's where you're probably not going to want to pick and choose your favorite change tools. When you have massive change, that's dramatic change that touches a number of employees. So in Comcast fashion, if it was a change that was a dramatic process change, platform change, um, role change that impacted thousands of people across our enterprise, that's massive transformation for us. And that's where we didn't want to short change on our change strategy and, and our leverage of the tools. Um, but as you all know, organizations make decisions. And in some cases, part of the change management decision is we don't want all that change management. That's a decision um, and that's a fair decision as long as the organization knows that there's gonna be an erosion of the intended ROI around that change because they didn't actually lean into change where they should have. And that's the model here. So we typically, and I, all of your comments indicate this, typically when we get the phone call to say help during a project or, hey, where are those change management resources or where's HR, you know, um, we're ready to deploy now. We need change management to come in and help us get this through to the finish line. Typically where we find ourselves is in a place of, hey, can you build those job aids? Can you get that training ready to go? We're, we're ready to go. We've tested, we're ready for launch and we just need some training, some comms. Um, if we could just get that cranked out, we'll be good. And that's where we find ourselves on this model, right? We find ourselves on the life 
cycle of a transformative exercise, well to the right of vision, well to the right of strategy and design and build and test and now we're at deploy. And typically, and I think a lot of your comments speak to this, and this certainly has been my experience. Um, when I've been engaged at the test deploy phase, inevitably I find that not all the stakeholders have been engaged. So what we're deploying isn't gonna solve our problem because well to the left, when we were visioning and putting together the strategy, we left key stakeholders out in part purposely. Maybe we didn't want all those stakeholders in the conversation. Some of them would resist. So we just don't invite them to the meeting. <laughs> you know, um, in some cases, people that were in the meetings thought they were aligned, but now that we're at the point of deployment, they realize, wow, we weren't aligned. We were talking past each other. And we end up again, back to the left, trying to sort out what should have happened at the strategy execution level. So I, th I think none of this comes as a surprise that when you're engaged at the deployment phase, it's too late. Now you're just trying to get a sense of where, where you're gonna land upon execution so you know how far back you have to go in fallout to fix and to realign and maybe even to retool. So I'm curious to you know, open it up right now and just see if there's anybody that has a good example of coming into the change model at this point and, and having that kind of an experience what the nature of the project was or and then what you did about it. I know I you all have, have an some. example. Yeah, good, great. Uh, is that okay to talk? Please. Yeah, so I was brought in back to Temple University to assist with the, an, a, the launch of an online master's program. And uh, they had already contracted with a university team for online course development and their vision did not match mine in terms of what I thought would be the best approach in, in development. So I lay out my new vision had to go back to the design team and explain that, that what they said, what they proposed was nice, but uh, we needed a different vision. And basically, and I had to convince leadership and then convey the message to faculty. So basically the strategy was leadership wanted an online program. They didn't specify the format, synchronous, asynchronous. The design team was very comfortable in working with asynchronous projects. And I felt that for that level of program, you needed to have both synchronous and asynchronous and based on my research and experience. So I had to convince leadership first, why? And then uh, go back to faculty and see if they would agree with that. And then once I had buy-in from those two groups, I was able to then go back to the design team and just say, this is how we are gonna go from now on. Yeah. And it worked. But you had to go all the way back to the vision stage. It yeah, like. it, it was a process, but it, yeah. and, it, and with providing arguments and, and um, explanations why, right? That could great. resonate with all stakeholders. That's great. Others? Don't need to be shy or put something that you chat. Or chat, yeah, sure. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. This is Dina Peralt. I'm sorry I was a few minutes late to the no, no worries. session. Good morning. I am in my office, obviously, with my mask on. Um, but good morning. What, what I found um, is even when we get the vision approved early on, um, once we get through the pilot and we've done all the communications and we start seeing maybe unintended consequences and we have to sort of redirect, it's almost like we forgot the reason why we were starting the initiative to begin with. And we all end up having to circle the wagons and go back again and redo again. And it's incredibly frustrating. Mm -hmm. So where I work, we have a, it's a, a, a holding company uh, that has 28 franchises. So trying to get all the franchisees basically on board has been um, a bit of a struggle, but that's what I see is we kind of, we're all going through it. We're going through our strategy execution. We've designed it. We're ready to roll it out. We hit a couple of hiccups that we assumed were going to happen. And we had sort of courses of action, depending on, you know, the sort of the decision tree. Do we go left? Do we go right? 
And the minute we hit a couple of them, everyone goes, see, I told you this was a terrible idea. We can never do this. Da, da, da. And then we're back to the drawing board. So yeah. I would love anything that could get us through those sticking points sort of early on that doesn't sort of keep derailing the project. Let, let me ask you on that example, because to me, you said there was alignment to the vision, but then it sounded like people were literally laying in wait for the moment where the, politi the, the, the project derailed that it was politically correct to then call the project into question. Exactly kind of go, right. 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 So, yeah, so that, I think that's part of the issue is, are we really aligned or are we not? Right. So I think we are. I, I would suggest you're not. I would suggest you've got fake nodding. <laughs> exactly. And then um, you used a, a term a minute ago, and I've already forgotten what it was. Shoot. Maybe I'll come back to it. I'm sorry. But, uh, but the gist of it was, yeah, you think you've got sort of everything. Exactly. You said everything's aligned, but, but not quite. Yeah. yeah I, th I think you're spot on. Um, and that's typical. You know, everybody was in the meeting. Everybody nodded. Everybody signed off. You know, Everyone said, what a great idea. We're going to save a lot of money. Great. You know, we're yeah. going to upgrade our processes. And then told you that wasn't going to work. And you're like, wait. <laughs> right. Exactly. And I would suggest that your vision you don't have alignment to the vision. And question for you in that space, did you have strong sponsorship? So not just a, you know, somebody with a high level title that put his or her name on it, but active, visible sponsorship. What did that or look so like? So looking you? back, absolutely not. Yeah. Because that happened, yeah. right? But yeah, in the moment, I honestly thought I did. Mm -hmm. But yeah, six months later, not so much. So it ended up happening. I still got the project completed, but it took longer and it was uh, clunkier and um, uncomfortable, but yeah. it's done. Yeah. And now, you know, now I'm looking back a couple of years and I go, see, <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> it worked out great, but. Yeah, I'll tell you, um, and I don't know if this was your, your case as well, but in terms of sponsorship, where we've had really difficult, massive change, we've actually found it to be more effective to have a coalition of sponsors not just one. So taking you know, the example of us moving from SAP success factors to Workday um, in the last year, we knew we had to have key stakeholders engaged in that, not just HR. We needed finance. Um, we needed payroll. We needed the, the divisions, um, the presidents in the field, because there was process change. This wasn't just a platform change. There was going to be policy and process change that really needed to accompany the shift. And we, we knew that we would hit resistance from a few of those pockets. So sponsorship, we actually had a you know, coalition of sponsors, um, the head of HR, the head of finance, but then a steering committee that brought other sponsors to the table around, you know, not just um, an awareness of where we were going, but part of the decision-making on the journey. So it wasn't one of those moments where when the project started to go you know, left, not right, um, they could kind of disengage from it and, and claim no knowledge. They were part of the architecture of it. And they're, they were asked to lean in and lead in some cases, components of it. That, that coalition of sponsorship, which prompted active sponsorship, not just sponsorship in name, kept, kept us aligned. And we had much greater success um, than we would have had otherwise. I don't know if that if that's how you went back and, and grabbed more um, firepower on the on the vision to the left, but that's how we did it. Cool. Others? Okay, well, Wayne, maybe just click the next slide so you can see the outcome. And we've talked about this. This is what you've all said. When when you guys you know, when we all find ourselves jumping into the change cycle this late in the process, speed the market and adoption are compromised because we might get something over the finish line, but we're going to have to go back, right? And typically, depending on how broken it is, you might be going back to the design phase, maybe to the build or test phase. But more often than not, like the example we just heard, you're going all the way back to why did we decide to embark on this in the first place? Are we all aligned that this is something we need to do? And, and it starts there, right? Um, and, and so going back that far has cost implications to the business. You know, in the case of Workday, um, if we had gone all the way back to visioning, imagine how much you're spending to have consulting resources, 
help you in a system, you know, kind of conversion that spans months, um, that's, that's millions of dollars, right? So to the degree that you can kind of make sure you're sorted to the left on this uh, cycle, um, the better off you're going to be. Um, and the more you're going to realize your intended um, return on investment. Like I said, a lot of projects, especially smaller ones that aren't quite as massive, the decision may be by the organization, hey, you know, we're okay, let's just go ahead and deploy and we'll go back and we'll fix it, you know, we'll go back and we'll shore up our vision and we'll shore up the strategy as we go. That is a strategy in and of itself. Um, there's still erosion of your intended, you know, return on investment, but less significant, right? And so in some cases that's healthy and that's okay. Um, but for massive change, um, you wanna be in a different place. So maybe we go to the next slide. For massive change, you really want to be here. You know, you want to be at the intersection of vision shaping, okay, how are we going to go about, you know, the strategy to execute this thing? And we, you know, as, as, as folks, particularly in HR, that support change, um, sometimes aren't included in those vision and strategy sessions. So I would say if you're not engaged in a project you know is going to need to be launched, um, that is massive, transformative in nature, and you're not part of or privy to or as connected as you can be to the left on this Chevron, um, to understanding is there alignment to the vision and who is involved in shaping strategy, um, get yourself in there. Because <laughs> you're going to find yourself there anyway if the project doesn't work out or if you're called to save it. Um, and so speaking of, we spoke a little bit about sponsorship, but kind of curious what folks have done to build um, their networks, their change networks. <laughs> we call it core network at Comcast. So these are the folks that you would bring in to create awareness, <coughs> sorry, and, and desire and knowledge, you know, kind of the ADK of ADCAR around the change. And I spoke a little bit about this earlier, you know, and we do this every day, you know, when we don't want resistance to something that we want to see done, we don't invite the resistors to the party. But in massive transformational change, you must have the resistors to the party. <laughs> they will show up anyway to the party uninvited later on. So it's best to get them engaged early on understand what their resistance or barrier points are so you can get alignment again to the vision and the strategy because they'll show up at deployment and then you're going to go back and have to convince them. So it's best to kind of engage them right out of the gate. In our case, again, with the Workday um, example, we form design teams and we grab folks from finance, grab folks from our field locations to be part of forming the strategy, having their fingerprints on, on it, understanding what their issues were. And you're right, you do slow down in this phase to go fast later, but you prevent a whole lot of rework um, by having their engagement early on. Curious from folks where, where you've seen that done well in your org or where, you know, maybe it fell apart. Can we answer some of the chat? Melanie, uh, similar to what you were saying, and, and, and so I work for a consulting firm, and, and so I've seen this in, in many organizations, and, and where we've involved the resistors, quote unquote, up front and in that, that initial strategy piece, what we've found is, and in many cases, you can actually turn them into champions of mm -hmm. whatever the project might be. Mm -hmm. And so here's someone who traditionally speaking, would have caused kind of a lot of havoc and a lot of resistance with their reporting structure, um, you know, as you've went further down the path, but involving them early, they felt like they had a say in the project and they were able to shape it and it gave them a sense of ownership. And so they yeah. ultimately became champions for us, which was really interesting. Yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely right. Mm. Others? Um, Melanie, this is Manisha. So very similar to what you were sharing, uh, we were going through a large HCM, you know, um, transformation change. And uh, what we did there as well was, you know, like you mentioned, uh, you know, had a steering committee in place um, right at the get-go, but then also 
um, had um, change champions, not only just at the leadership level, but also um, more so at the, you know, um, staff level as well, early on in the process across different parts of the business, you know, so finance, payroll, uh, HR, um, you know, the more of the operations part, we had change champions across the business that were involved early yeah. on. And I think that helped with some of the success um, that we saw with the transformation. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I think that's, for us, that's our core network, you know, kind of functional leaders, um, SMEs that play a particular role with the change, but the core network of change leaders is essential. That's kind of your secret network of where are we still finding resistance? Where are people not, uh, not on board? Um, where do we need to go back and shore up? Um, that's, that's absolutely right. The other piece of this um, that I've noticed um, on a couple of key initiatives at Comcast is where you don't necessarily have alignment among the leaders um, and you can see it. They say all the right things in the meeting. Everybody's on board. You're going down the path of a transformative change, but you know for a fact there's not complete alignment. Where we've had some success is going a layer or two deeper where people in the org actually want to see that change happen. And they're willing to cooperate and they're willing to kind of lean in and do the work. And by virtue of them leaning in and their leaders seeing that their own teams are leaning in, cooperating, collaborating and making progress, it brings leadership along. And, and we've had tremendous success where, you know, the teams underneath the team actually have, you know, had success around a few proof points for the project that then leadership could take credit to. And again, you get them engaged, you know, more than you would have otherwise, perhaps, you know, in a very real tactical sense of where the project's going and the value to the org. Curious where others have um, seen some of those dynamics play out. Any other tricks anybody else has used to kind of generate alignment at the top and or tease out where you know there isn't alignment, but no one will say it? Can I ask a question? Sure. So when you have to go to that level strategy, what do you think are the incentives for the employee, just the completion of the project itself? Right. Right. Well, and, and so that's a critical question you ask yourself with change management, right? What's the what's in it for me? Not only organizationally, but but by employee type. Why should the employee want this change? Or why should my teammate, my colleague want this change? And being able to articulate what that is um, for folks. If you don't have that laid out, the what's in it for me, then when there's organizational change, individual change will will lag. You know, my org might be doing something, but I'm not bought in. Mel Penn is not bought in because I don't see the value to me. So your change strategy absolutely has to, you know, communicate um, and, and be able to convince in many respects that at the individual level, this is going to be better. And here's why. Even if there's change, even if it's your job's going to be different but here's how it's going to be different. And here's how we think it's gonna be better for you, for the organization, for our customers, for our clients, being able to articulate that um, is part of that change planning. And that means you really do have to outline where are we today and what does this change mean to the business, to people's roles, to the role they play, to the work that they'll do um, so that you can have that conversation. Thank you. No, it almost seems like it's a stakeholder management uh, strategy, right? Yes. Identify your stakeholders, who's on board, who's not. And you really have to manage that process, right? Versus that's let right. it evolve. And, and that's kind of where you have to ask yourself, why aren't my leaders aligned? Because what's yeah. in it for them and what might be changing and going away with this change that we need to get honest about and care for, Right. Um, and, and those are tricky conversations. There are ways you can tease that kind of conversation out um, in, in steering committee meetings, you know, where, where there's a meeting before the meeting and a meeting after the meeting, um, which is where the real talk happens, not in the steering committee itself, but where data and where project health puts a spotlight on, we're not all aligned yet. Why not? 
and you just keep coming back. We're not aligned yet. Why not? And, and not, I think the biggest thing in transformation is to resist the temptation to keep going when you know you aren't sorted to the left. Because it will, you will have to come back if you're not fully sorted to the left on this chevron. So resist the temptation to keep moving. I think um, on our workday pieces, and certainly when we implemented SAP success factors in 20 in 2008, and I led that um, implementation, we had portions in that conversion where we had to go back and say we're not yet sorted. We won't move on. And to the point where we, we actually were in the final module of putting payroll requirements in and we did not have alignment and we didn't move forward. So the project came to a halt and there was a tremendous cost to pushing it out another quarter. But we knew that the risk of going live with payroll not being organized around requirements was too great. And so that was one I was willing to put my body on the tracks for and say, you know what, I know there's cost, I know there's risk, but we're not moving forward. We're pushing it out a quarter. And, and the pressure of those dollars actually helped leaders and uh, get wrapped around the requirements <laughs> and, and us get back on track because we were, we were forced to reckon with alignment in order to move forward. And so that's just one example, but curious if anybody got another example they'd like to share. I have something on the same line, actually. I was talking how I came on board to develop this program. The first meeting I had with faculty, my question was if there was an agreement in place about what that would mean in terms of intellectual property. And I think I hit a very important point because it's very common in higher ed, more, more than not, for people to leave that conversation for later and that later never happens. So I was able to work with Legal Council and develop a clear agreement that everybody knew before even getting too deep into course development. So this way there was transparency. So I think it's important to understand what is, what is of value to the stakeholders mm -hmm. to build trust. And once you build trust, then you can push the, the project forward in an expedite manner. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, trust is huge, right? Um, if, if you've got a broken, you know, kind of trust container, um, it is gonna be hard for people to take the leaps of faith, especially in massive change. Others. Mel, there's a question from Diane about okay. what are your thoughts on having a communications plan for each stage of the transformation? Yeah, I mean, I really loved, so what you don't see here is kind of change management to me is encompassing of comms, training, and um, reinforcement. So to me, comms threads this whole chevron, right? You have to have strong comms leading into even a vision um, being articulated, you know, kind of the why are we embarking on this journey? And it has to connect to something very um, tangible um, to employees, like, they have to see the business connection. They have to see the connection of what you're doing to the customers or to them as employees in the workplace. So having comms thread each step in this journey with not just the status of where we are in process as an accountability mechanism, but also a bit of, let me remind you why this is important. Let me remind you why this is gonna be great at the end. Let me remind you of the pain we can expect. You know, expectation setting and transformation is huge. Not everything is going to be rosy. Some things are going to be clunky when you deploy. And part of it, you know, is intended. You don't, you can't solve for everything. Um, some things will be unexpected and you'll have to, you know, address it. Um, so kind of laying the expectation of what the journey is going to be through the process. Absolutely huge. It brings people along um, on, on the path with you, as opposed to shocking them <laughs> months later when you've gone you know, dormant or dark for a period of time, and then you emerge with launch. Um, so absolutely critical. There's another question from, hopefully I'm pronouncing what I say, Ed. Do you feel that at times during matching transformations, we tend to focus too much on the eventual outcomes? It distracted us, key stakeholders tend to demand results rather than driving the actual process, communications, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the answer to that is yes, and it's interesting you say that because I think in many respects, um, for some of the transformation work that I've seen where it was 
it wasn't mandated. There wasn't a compliance element. Like we had to hit a deadline because, you know, um, there was a compliance element to not hitting it. Where it's been discretionary, what our timelines are. I think where we've seen our, our challenges is we get married to a timeline and, and married to, you know, I will hit that deadline no matter what. I will produce element of success. I will check a box. But what we don't really, I think what we underestimate in doing that is that you, you may have achieved an on-time, on-budget deliverable, but have you really changed behavior? You know, case in point, when we launched Success Factors SAP, we were on time, on budget after we recast the schedule. We pushed it back, like I said, a quarter. But we didn't go about change management in a way that um, pivoted people's behaviors to what we really wanted the system to drive. We kind of got the system in, but people developed shadow systems, shadow mechanisms, shadow approval processes, everything that the system was intended to kind of rectify, <laughs> we didn't care for. We, we, we were charged with get this thing in, get it in on this date, X, check, check, check. But then you know, three months later, we realized that all that time, effort, and energy to actually hit our targeted deadlines and, and budget were for not because we didn't really care for the journey people were on in the change cycle. So process of change management, winning hearts and minds. And then, by the way, what I would have done as well is trust but verify. If you're looking to change behavior, have mechanisms where you're actually testing to see if behavior is changing or are people developing shadow systems and processes behind what you've done. Um, we didn't do that either in, in the first round. And so I think, I think you can absolutely get fixated on outcome without paying much attention to the process along the way. Yeah, that's why I think uh, the agile ways of working that Steve and I focus on, right. it incorporates the customer along the process. So you're, you know, every two weeks you're getting input from the customer. This is what I want. You know, right. and so you're inculcating that accountability and that communications as part of the process. So that's right. Well, in in our last um, kind of few minutes together, just curious, mm -hmm. where are some of you right now on a transformation journey? Where are you on this Chevron? So, Wayne, if you want to pull up just that last slide, yeah. it'll show mm -hmm. the benefits, obviously, the gains to being over here to the left. But it, does anybody want to share where you are currently? and what you might do, you know, going forward or differently now that we've chatted. Um, this is Manisha. So I'm actually in the middle of deploying a um, expansion of, you know, one of our employee relations model. And um, I think we started some of the communication with um, the key parts of the business at the deploy stage. And um, I think, uh, you know, obviously some of it was because there were delays, um, significant from a timing standpoint, but lots of other factors, including COVID. But I think I feel that, you know, um, maybe starting early, like you said, Naomi, um, you know, at the strategy execution, they knew all it was coming, but right. um, the timing was just not, we kind of sat still for almost a year and a half, not letting, not sharing how things are progressing. Um, I think the constant communication probably would have helped. Mm -hmm. um, so they, the visibility and the awareness is there and versus kind of the business feeling a bit stranded. Right. 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 Um, so that's probably what I would have done differently. Right. That's great. Yeah. You want to avoid the wait, what moment? Yeah. <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Wait, what? Um, yeah, that, that's great. How about others? Dina, you want to mention your thing? Yeah, we uh, keep talking more about <clears throat> strategic plans and what we want. HR to look like or what we want other business operations to look like. And although I've been giving, given some year-end goals that are very specifically say, we want things to look like this. When I talk to the executive team, they're not in alignment on what it actually looks like. So I really don't know what to do at this point. So I've kind of slammed the brakes because I've been down the road with them before and I don't want to be like, I'm executing, I'm already there. 
and they're like, you're moving too fast. That's not what we said. And for me to slow down is, uh, that's not natural for me. I'm already mm-hmm. sort of running through five walls and waiting for people to catch up to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this time, you know, I've been given a couple of projects and I have, it's May and I've done nothing. And mm-hmm. so that makes me a little antsy and agitated. Um, but truly I, I get them, it's like herding cats trying to get them all together. And I'm like, I need to nail it down or we don't really want to do it. We're right. not really sure what we want. So we're not doing it. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I think you're a comfortable um, conversation. No, you're, you're spot on. And I, I should have mentioned this when we talked about, you know, have you ever walked away from a project? You're kind of in that space. And um, I am much more discerning now of things that I lean into and I'll push based on what I think the readiness factor is. And you're picking up on it. They're not ready. Something's holding people back. Something's causing amnesia to set in. People wake up and go, what are we doing? Wait, what? I, I think those are moments where you have to really be thoughtful about, do we move forward? Do I lean in? Or do I let the business mature a little bit more? Do I let something political get sorted out before this you know, kind of comes back onto the agenda? Um, there's a readiness component here that could even sit well outside your project where something's just not lined up right to support the work. And I think you having the antenna up to go, I'm not pushing. If the org's not pushing, the business isn't pushing, leadership likes being chaotic and not coming together, then great. We'll, we'll go on to do other things. Yeah. I, I found myself being very stingy with, with that space I'm in. It, I think the worst comment that, that I get from our team is, well, the advisory board thought this was a great idea. I'm like, okay, yeah. but right. what? Well, it's, you know, it would be really great if we could do a something. I'm like, well, what does that mean for us? Right. And so, right. so what does is, what is Dita say when her boss comes to her and say, well, it's May, you haven't done anything. What's going to go on? So I, uh, I'm, I'm very blunt anyway, and I'm lucky. <laughs> I've been with this company for 12 years and they know me very well. <laughs> And if I wasn't blunt, they'd say you're not bought in. So they, they know me well enough to know. Okay. So I literally say, when you tell me exactly what you want, I'm in and I will get it done. Right. But, um, but you need to make a decision. Right. And then, you know, and I'll literally put them all in the same room and say, what do you think? And I see them all disagreeing with each other. And I was like, well, until you get it figured out, I'm going to go work on something else that I know mm-hmm. I can work on. You have um, a level of trust I, I am and, lucky that I have the yeah. luxury to do that at this yeah. point. Well, you yeah. build up trust and confidence in you over time. So it's not something right. you do right away. And the same thing with Melanie. I think she had done that over years to kind of demonstrate that. Right. Yeah. Not easy. No, right. and, but they know, if, if, they know that if they give it to me, it's going to get done. Yeah. But, um, you know, and, and my former boss who retired about a year and a half ago, used to joke and he said, just don't leave bodies in the wake. <laughs> and that's what I would do. I, I would just run everyone over till I got it done. And um, <laughs> it's not helpful for anybody. So, yeah. Now you're right to put the spotlight on the vision and the strategy. There's no alignment. So without that, you, you really can't move forward. Well, I know we're running out of time, so I'm just so thankful that we had a chance to chat. Yeah. Um, if these slides are helpful to you, it's just kind of a reminder of where to play. Um, you know, I'll just share this. You know, you can take this and read it. This was kind of our lessons learned having implemented uh, Workday. Um, in January, um, we did things a little differently than we did when we launched SAP Success Factors in 2008. Um, some of these go to the heart of leaning further to the left, getting stakeholder buy-in, keeping people's fingerprints on the end product, um, and building accountability along the journey. So, um, you know, happy to share this. And if it's helpful to you, um, th- that's great. Wayne, Steve, thank you for letting me yeah, uh, no, chat. and. Uh, Thanks to everybody on the call. Phenomenal. Thanks, everybody. Again, this is a informal ad hoc. We, I, I kept writing a lot of interesting insights here. So uh, we'll keep uh, communicating. We'll, we'll share the slides with everybody and, and some of the findings. And uh, any questions, just kind of you know reach out to us and hope to see you in June. We'll figure out the date for that, but uh, stay tuned. And Mel, thank you very much. Really no, appreciate it. No, thank you all. All right. Onward. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye.